Hi, I'm Lisa Hepp, and I'm an epidemiologist at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In this topic, we'll be reviewing method to monitor and capture secondhand smoke exposure at an individual level. We know that there are two ways of doing this, or two common ways, one being hair nicotine, which we talk about in another presentation, and the other is salivary cotinine, which we'll be discussing here. So in this presentation, I'll be giving you a brief background and an overview of what secondhand smoke is and what biomarkers are, and specifically what salivary cotinine is and how you can use it as a biomarker for secondhand smoke exposure. I'll be reviewing with you the steps necessary in conducting a biomonitoring study, which would include field materials, labeling, data collection sheets, and the sample collection process. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, what exactly do we mean by secondhand smoke? So secondhand smoke is actually a combination of two types of cigarette smoke or cigar smoke, any type of burning tobacco smoke. The first type is called mainstream smoke. So mainstream smoke is actually what is exhaled by the smoker. They take in a deep puff of smoke and then it goes into their lungs and then they exhale that smoke. The other part of secondhand smoke is known as side stream smoke, and that's actually the smoke that comes off of the cigarette or the cigar or the pipe itself. So it's a combination of mainstream and side stream smoke that makes up secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke is very comparable to what the smoker is actually breathing in themselves as well. So it contains almost the same chemical makeup. They say approximately 4,000 known chemical components the very same which cause all types of diseases and illnesses in adults and children. So exactly why would we want to monitor secondhand smoke? Generally, there are a handful of reasons why you'd want to do it, and one of the main reasons is here on the slide is to actually document the extent to which a population or a group of individuals may be exposed to secondhand smoke. This in turn can help motivate the policy and actually give reason to monitoring compliance to ensure that laws that are in place are actually effective and that the secondhand smoke levels people might be exposed to are low and non-existent. And then the last point here to actually monitor trends, which can be done through comparing buildings, different cities within a region, or even comparing countries if it's on a large enough scale. On this slide, we see a figure that is illustrating the causal pathway of secondhand smoke and how you can actually monitor it through different stages. So as you see, you can monitor secondhand smoke through air monitoring, through personal air monitoring, and through biomarkers. And it's this last part here, biomarkers, that we're going to be focusing on with today's topic. And as you can see, through the measurement of secondhand smoke and the use of biomarkers, you're actually being able to measure a dosage of secondhand smoke. So this dosage, then, is dependent on an individual's exposure. And an individual's exposure is actually dependent on the concentration. So all these things add up together and can give us the measurement of secondhand smoke in a biomarker such as hair or saliva. So we keep talking about biomarkers as a way to measure secondhand smoke, but what exactly, again, do we mean by biomarker? So a biomarker is actually an indicator that can be measured in a biological system, such as through saliva, blood, urine, or even hair. They provide an indication of what a human or an individual's exposure is to various different toxins or other environmental sources. But today we're going to be focusing on biomarkers that can assist in determining exposure to secondhand smoke as related to tobacco smoke. Biomarkers of tobacco exposure have been used for many years to assess misclassification of smoking status, for example, in, in surveys and other epidemiological studies. And they've also been used to monitor and track population exposure to tobacco over time and in various places. A wide variety of biomarkers have been developed and used to measure the chemical makeup of tobacco smoke, and these include nicotine, cotinine, which is actually a derivative of nicotine, and other carcinogenic compounds such as tobacco-specific nitrosamines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Other toxic chemicals such as carbon monoxide have also been used. So an ideal smoking biomarker would actually be specific to tobacco combustion, something that actually is derived from the tobacco itself. 
for instance, nicotine or cotinine, and even tobacco-specific nitrosamines. Another point that a great biomarker specific to tobacco smoking would naturally have a long biological half-life, and it would be an agent associated with or correlated with health effects. It's also important that the biomarker has some reproducibility, and practically it needs to have minimal invasiveness, and the cost should be relatively low. So as I've previously mentioned, there are numerous biomarkers that exist and several biomarkers that are specific to tobacco combustion. In these presentations on this site, we're actually only going to be discussing hair nicotine and salivary cotinine. And the reason that we've picked those two biomarkers is we feel that they're relatively easy to collect, transportation is very easy to ship to a lab for processing, the cost is also relatively low in conducting these. But they have pros and cons, and you need to decide which one is best for you. Ultimately, the goals and aims of your project are going to determine which biomarker of exposure best suits your needs and best suits the proposed study. It's important to note here that you can see hair nicotine and salivary cotinine. They also provide different time lengths or time frames for which a person would be exposed. So for instance, you see on hair nicotine, it's a long-term dose. You're looking at an exposure that happened one to three months prior. Whereas if you're using saliva to measure secondhand smoke exposure, it's on a much shorter term, only on one to two days before sample collection. Compared to each other, salivary cotinine is actually a little bit more difficult to handle just in terms of storing and shipping to the lab. You need to actually keep it in the freezer and sent to the lab on dry ice. Whereas with hair nicotine, you don't need to keep it in any sort of special cool environment. It can be kept at room temperature and just shipped to the lab in a standard mailing envelope. And then on the other hand, some uncertainties still exist in terms of doing the hair analysis with, for the nicotine. It's important to capture what the natural hair color is of the individual and whether or not they've had any hair treatment, such as a perm or any hair dye or hair coloring put onto their hair because this could potentially affect the absorption of nicotine into the hair. But both methods are relatively accepted in the field and will provide ample evidence to support whether or not an individual or a population was exposed to secondhand smoke. So before beginning to actually collect and monitor secondhand smoke exposure at an individual level particularly, it's necessary to actually establish objectives or aims of your project. So your aims or your objectives should be specific and indicate what your study population is. If it's a trying to address too broad of a population, it's likely not feasible and may not always answer your study questions. So those are some of the things that you need to think about before identifying your objectives for your study. So here we've listed the three generally most common objectives for monitoring secondhand smoke at an individual level. The first one, to characterize the average level of nicotine or cotinine in a specific population exposed to secondhand smoke. Second one, to identify factors related to differences in levels of secondhand smoke exposure among different populations. And thirdly, to evaluate the impact of smoking restrictions on secondhand smoke concentrations on specific populations. So these three objectives are relatively broad and don't specify which specific populations you would like to address. So that's something that you need to have in the back of your mind first. For example, if the goal of the project is to estimate secondhand smoke exposure among hospitality employees, which would be your specific population, you would then need to recruit employees from various hospitality venues to participate. However, it's nearly impossible to collect information or data on all hospitality workers, so a subset of this population would likely need to be selected. And so by a subset of the hospitality employee population, I mean that you would need to go in and select a smaller number that could perhaps represent the entire population of hospitality industry, just to give you a, an idea of what their exposure might be like. Here we see a picture of a participant in the field providing a salivary cotinine sample to the field worker. In her hand, you can see she has a salivette which is the tube that she collects the salivary sample in. In upcoming slides, we'll review this entire process as well as the salivette in more detail.
So once you have your objectives and your goals determined and you've decided which biomarker you want to go forth, and used to measure or monitor secondhand smoke exposure at an individual level, there are several steps that you need to take before you can actually get into the field and start collecting your sample. Those steps include obtaining ethics approval. And ethics approval is often needed when working with and collecting personal information from a study participant, whether or not that's biological in nature. And the steps necessary to receive this type of approval depends on your organization or your country where you're submitting the application to do the study. Generally, the objectives of the Ethics Committee is simply to ensure and protect the rights and welfare of participants from the study procedures. Beyond determining the population that you'll be working with, it's important that you determine an appropriate sample size or the number of participants needed to produce any meaningful results and avoid making incorrect assumptions with the final data. So here too, sample size calculations are dependent on the aims or the objectives of your project. When determining the number of participants needed, issues of feasibility must be considered, including time constraints, as well as monetary and resource restrictions. So again, while collecting a large sample size may provide the assurance of addressing the aims of the project, it may not be feasible or viable. In future slides, we're going to actually go over a few points on how to actually do sampling. So now you have your sample size and you know the population that you want to work with. Now you need to actually request participation. You need to be able to secure the number of participants that you want. So whether that's through advertisements in the newspaper or if it's by working with a local doctor's office in their waiting room and soliciting people to participate in the study, you need to have a method set up on how you're going to recruit individuals into the study. So it's important then that you also have secured a location where you can collect samples and a time frame that's most convenient for people to come. And the very last thing then is to prepare sample collection kits. And again, in future slides, we're going to go over what sample collection kits actually entail. So here we see a document that we refer to as our informed consent. And as we talked about previously, you needed to obtain ethics committee approval. You also need to obtain consent from the participant before you go ahead and collect information from them, whether that's on the questionnaire or a biological sample such as hair or saliva or equotinine in this particular instance. So this document just goes over the points of the study, the procedures that will be conducted, how long the procedure will actually last for the participant, and any risks or benefits that the subject may actually receive. Now this may be orally presented to a future participant or subject, or in some instances it's actually a written document and you can ask for their signature. It really is dependent on what your ethics review committee permits. So as I discussed earlier, I said we were going to give you some example sampling strategies so that you could draw in the population that you needed to collect the samples from. And here are the two most common ways of doing that. One is the random sampling and the other is non-random sampling. Generally, random sampling can include stratified random sampling or multi-stage cluster sampling, two topics that can be rather in-depth and not actually the purpose of this presentation. But as you can see here, we've given a description and the pros and cons of random sampling. So for most studies, you'll actually be using non-random sampling. For example, in a study, if you were looking to measure secondhand smoke exposure among children and parents, you could recruit these, as I, I mentioned earlier, in a doctor's office at the waiting room or through a daycare. You could solicit them there, asking if they'd be interested in providing a sample and a brief questionnaire. So when studying the predictors of secondhand smoke exposure or evaluating the impacts of interventions on exposure, these approaches for recruitment are recommended. The non-random sampling approaches for recruitment are recommended. Only when the goal is to estimate prevalence of secondhand smoke among a broader population would random sampling design be necessary or required. So for the continuation of this presentation, we're going to follow what we refer to as a cross-sectional survey or a non-random sampling convenience survey. And we're going to be looking at bars and nightclubs. And we'll say we're going to select 10 bars or 10 nightclubs to participate in the study. And these bars or nightclubs will be determined based solely on what the field staff feels is uh, most popular bar, try to vary them in different socioeconomic 
areas and different locations within a city. And then we'll select five employees from each of the 10 bars to provide a biomarker sample and to answer some questions on a brief survey. So these employees would thus be non-smokers, as smokers, of course, would have a high level of nicotine or cotinine in their hair or their saliva. Here we see a list of the field materials that you'll need to compile and put into a kit when going out to collect the samples. You'll need your consent form if you're using a written document to obtain individual consent from the participant. If you're using an oral consent, you obviously will not need a written document, and instead you would just simply read to the subject the procedures and the aims and the objectives, as well as any risks or benefits associated with the study. And if it's the oral consent, then the subject would simply reply verbally, yes, they wish to participate, or no, they would not. If it was a written consent, they would actually put their signature onto the document itself. In addition to the consent form, you would need questionnaires or other data collection forms. You'll need gloves. You'll need a series of salivettes. And you'll see the salivette on the right part of the slide. You'll notice that the salivette has several different components. It's as if it's a mini test tube with a cap. So it has the cap, it has the inner tube, it has a cotton roll, and it also has the main part, which is referred to as the centrifuge tube. So the cotton roll would be gently placed inside the participant's mouth, and this is what collects the saliva and would be sent to the lab to extract any coatening that is present in the saliva. In terms of the process of actually collecting the saliva sample, we'll be reviewing that in just a few slides. So you also need hand sanitizer, paper towels, a cooler with ice packs or ice, tape, and weatherproof labels. And we'll review what each of these are for in the upcoming slides as well. So as I mentioned, you'd need to obtain consent, whether this is orally or on a written document. You would also want to collect any background information on your questionnaire or your data forms. Background information would include their smoking history, whether or not they've ever been a smoker, what their exposure pattern is to someone smoking, whether that's at work or at home or at restaurants or on transportation. So once you've collected this background information, now is a good time to go ahead and put on the gloves and start collecting the sample. You'll want the participant to go ahead and wash their hands, either with warm soapy water or antimicrobial hand sanitizer if a sink and soap is not available. And you'll want to do this before they actually handle the cotton swab or the salivate itself. Once the subject has their hands clean, you'll go ahead and instruct them to remove the cap off the salivate and to place the cotton roll directly into the mouth, trying to minimize touching it with their fingers. The salivate should be placed towards one side of their mouth next to their cheek and their teeth. You'll go ahead and instruct the subject or the participant to gently start chewing for approximately two minutes. Make sure that the subject or the participant doesn't chew directly onto the cotton swab. The chewing will stimulate saliva production and then the saliva will be absorbed onto the cotton roll. After two minutes, instruct the participant to go ahead and expel or to gently place the cotton swab back into the inner tube of the salivate, again trying to minimize touching it with the subject's hands or fingers. It's ideal to have the sample tube or the salivate pre-labeled with a unique identifier that matches the subject background information previously collected, and we'll review in just a few slides what exactly we mean by a unique identifier. But it's important to remember that all forms and samples collected need to have a label so that you can link them to each other for analysis. You'll go ahead and recap the salivette, ensuring that it's nice and tight and secure. And it's often helpful to go ahead and place a piece of tape around the top of the cap so that it adds an extra seal. You'll place the tube or the salivette into a cooler with ice so that it stays nice and cold for storage and transportation back to the lab at the end of the day. As I mentioned, it's important that each subject or participant has a unique identification code. And as I stated, it needs to be placed onto the centrifuge tube and all questionnaires or background data collection forms that are associated with an individual. And again, it's to make sure that during analysis that the data and questionnaire forms can be linked easily to the sample collected.
each individual should have their own ID number. It shouldn't be repeated, and it shouldn't be a number that includes any of their personal identification information, such as a date of birth, a social security number, or any other ID number that's unique for an individual. It's important that you keep a list of these identification numbers that you've generated so that you can determine which ones have been used and which ones have not been used. Sometimes it's helpful to have these IDs pre-printed on all forms and on labels that can be quickly adhered to samples, such as the salivet. And in this manner, you would go ahead and ensure when a subject or a participant comes in to provide a sample that you can quickly just grab the necessary instruments that you need for that particular field visit and just want to check that all the ID numbers actually all match before proceeding. As I've previously stated, it's important that the samples are kept on ice and in a cooler before shipment to the lab for analysis or even shipment to a freezer before they're sent to the lab. This will ensure the quality of the sample. It's also important to seal the tubes tightly to avoid any sort of contamination or evaporation that might occur. It's necessary then to also record the time between collection and freezing and to place the samples in a freezer, preferably at a minus 20 degrees Celsius freezer, until shipment to the lab. Once you've collected all of the samples for your particular study, it's important then that you ship them with sufficient ice, preferably dry ice, to the lab, depending on how long the shipping time is. It's important that you have someone that oversees the project, preferably someone who understands the protocol thoroughly. This person would then be in charge of participant recruitment, distributing study materials to the field worker. And the project coordinator would then keep track of the locations and the unique identifiers of the participants that have provided samples, as well as data entry. And they would be tasked with ensuring the shipment to the lab has been done correctly. Samples for hair nicotine and salivary coatening will need to be sent to a sophisticated lab with the abilities to process each. Your lab may be able to handle this, but you would need to have assurance before going ahead and sending them to the lab and that the processes and procedures have been reproduced many times over. This is something that Johns Hopkins may be able to assist in identifying whether or not your lab is a lab that can handle this type of analysis or we may be able to identify a lab in your region or your area that could do this laboratory analysis for you. So once data have been entered and cleaned in the database, statistical analysis can be conducted in an effort to make inferences about the research questions that are most relevant to the study goals and objectives that you've set up at the beginning. Analysis conducted using statistical software may range from descriptive to multivariate analysis, and again, depends on the objectives of the study, as well as the target audience of the findings. After data analysis, it's necessary then to disseminate the results to accomplish the goals and objectives of the study. So it's also often helpful to create a dissemination strategy during the planning and research design phase of the project, since the objectives for completing a secondhand smoke monitoring study will again influence who should receive the results and how to distribute the findings to this audience. So here at Hopkins, we may be able to provide assistance in collecting salivary coating or any other secondhand smoke evaluation types of procedures. For instance, we may be able to provide training on how to collect the samples and data analysis we might be able to help you in designing a study that accurately addresses your question and aims and objectives. We could also provide some laboratory assistance for analysis of the specimens or help you identify a lab that has this capability. We can do data analysis in conjunction with you, and we may be able to assist in generating reports and disseminating findings. So if you need technical assistance, please don't hesitate to contact us you can contact us here at the website by filling out a technical assistance request form, or you can email me directly. And we hope that this presentation on collecting salivary coatening samples was a useful presentation and a useful training tool for you. Thank you.